Our signal two, and then I will call to order this community uh, candidate town hall forum. Uh, this actually is not a town event. Uh, I am the chair of the Waterbury Select Board, uh, Roger Clapp, and I was asked by Elizabeth Brown, uh, who is organizing this event, uh, to moderate uh, after having done something similar uh, to this uh, for when the uh, issue of the uh, homeless shelter uh, came forward. So I said I'd be glad to do it as long as all four candidates were willing to participate and confirmed with them that they are indeed willing. So uh, we're going to be hearing from all four of our uh, candidates running for uh, state representative uh, here tonight. And I'll just go over a couple of the guidelines uh, and then the primer, which is really a repetition of the guidelines. Um, so uh, we're going to allow each of the candidates to talk for five to seven minutes. Uh, Amy Marshall Carney is over here. She is our timekeeper. So as soon as they start, uh, they'll have five minutes. She'll wave her hand. That means we've got two minutes left to wrap it up. Uh, and then uh, uh, we'll start with the current uh, people serving, uh, the Waterbury, Bolton, Huntington, Buell score. Uh, and then we'll move on to the uh, new challengers, uh, John Griffin and Elizabeth Brown. Uh, and then when they have all completed their statements, we're going to open it up to all of you. Uh, and uh, you can speak right from this podium over here. Anyone wishing to speak can get in line. We're gonna leave a full hour for that uh, so that uh, we'll hopefully hear from everyone who wants to talk and anyone who supports whatever uh, the person's saying, I ask that you just raise your hands like this so we don't have a lots of shouting and so forth. Uh, so if you, hear, if you like what you hear, you can just raise, raise your hand and get a sense of how much support the, the speaker has uh, or not. And uh, then we'll just move on to the next candidate. Everyone will have uh, two minutes to deliver their comments, okay? And we ask that you address issues of community importance, uh, something of importance to the town, to the state, uh, not necessarily national politics. Uh, we like to try to steer away from that. Uh, something more having to do perhaps with uh, flood mitigation. Uh, however, I will say, I will put a little small plug in for anyone that likes this, can come back on Monday, the 29th of uh, July, right to the same place, and we're gonna have a complete uh, select board hearing with the crew uh, to talk about flood mitigation, all issues having to do with elevations, buyouts, uh, everything having to do with flood, what's being done, what's being proposed, and there'll be uh, plenty of opportunity for community input on that as well. When everyone has finished commenting, or when we hit uh, an hour, uh, whichever comes first, uh, we'll maybe take a few more comments, uh, and uh, then each one of the candidates uh, will have five minutes to do a recap, address some of what they heard here tonight from you, and that will be it. So uh, I'll take some questions right now, and then I'll go back and do a primer, and then we'll get started with candidates. Does anyone have any questions that they want to ask about the procedure and how this is all going to work? Yes, sir. Where can we watch the live stream? Where can you watch the live stream? Over here. Uh, I don't know. You can't watch it. OK, so what is it? It's not live streamed. Okay, that's a good question. I don't know. Orca Media's YouTube channel. Orca Media's YouTube channel. Thank you. Got it. Anything else? Okay. And thanks also to Clark for setting up the uh, all the equipment here. Okay. Uh, now to the primer. Primer is about what you heard earlier. Uh, let's be respectful. We'll have one person talking at a time. Rather than everyone cheering or booing people, let's have none of that. If you like what you hear, just raise your hand. If you don't, you can, you can keep your hands down. Um, and um, again, we ask that you keep your topics, uh, your comments, to issues of community interest. Uh, and 
state interest and issues that will pertain to issues uh, that'll be dealt uh, with by the Vermont legislature. Yeah, I have another comment. So, since we have new candidates, can we ask questions? You can ask questions, but they won't be answering until the end of the uh, After thing. After an hour? Yeah. So that's, that's a, what's a little bit different about this particular format, is you're not gonna get immediate answers to your questions. So I would you know, just take, keep that in mind, and so it's more about hearing what is on your mind. If you have a particular opinion, you might as well voice it, uh, because they may not be able to cap, get all the answers in in the allotted five minutes at the end, right? So that's, that's how it works. Um, all right, if there are no more questions, I'll get started and uh, we'll ask Tom Stevens to start off. Uh, good evening. My name's Tom Stevens. I've been your state representative here from Waterbury, representing Bolton, Huntington, and Buell's Gore, as well as Duxbury for a couple of terms at the beginning of my time before redistricting. And I live over on Winooski Street. It was not damaged during the flood. Um, though I seem to have lost my wife to the long-term uh, recovery group for the next several months. Um, I am running because we are doing work that I would like to continue doing that is for the benefit of all Vermonters. Um, I have served now for 16 years, and that's eight terms. The last three terms I've been chair of the General Housing, uh, formerly known as the General Housing and Military Affairs Committee. Uh, just now known as the General and Housing Committee. And under this committee, housing is easy to figure out. It's affordable housing. It's how to build affordable housing. It's how to get people who are severely cost burdened, which is if you pay more than 50% of your income on housing and needing to be housed, you're severely housing burdened. Life is tough here. Life is extremely difficult here. Most people um, know the South Main Street apartments that were built by Down Street. Those apartments work with people who make 60% of the area median income, which is a HUD number, housing and urban development number. 200,000 Vermonters file income taxes for less than two, for, for less than $60,000 a year. So this state is made up of people who are working well below the median wage, or well below the livable wage for a family. And so the work that our committee has been doing specifically with housing, but not only, uh, has been trying to make sure that there's more housing being built, not just for people who are at the, at the 30 to 60% of area median income threshold, but people who are in the middle income, people who are trying to start uh, their families here, buy their first homes. We are trying to develop programs and have developed programs and made investments in these programs so that there are more people being able to get into housing that they can afford. That has little to do specifically with outside forces. And I'll get back to those in a couple of minutes. But the committee work that I do has also worked on labor issues, trying to work on increasing the minimum wage, trying to develop paid sick day programs, paid family leave programs, some of which we've gotten to, and some of which we haven't. It takes been taking years to try to get a program like family um, paid family leave, where um, had I qualified for it several years ago, I would have gotten uh, compensated for my time while I was taking care of my mother when she was ill or taking care of kids. So we are working on issues that are the underlying factors of success in the Vermont economy. Wages, housing, we'll hear more about child care. These are essential things that Vermonters need in order to be, afford to, to be able to live here affordably and to be able to put their dreams into effect. And it's really not been easy, and it's not always been successful. But that is part of the legislative process. Uh, we, I've been chair of the committee since, since the, the first year of COVID. And since then, as a state, using mostly federal dollars, we've invested close to a billion dollars in housing, but not just housing, also in rental supports which are direct payments to landlords in order to keep renters in their apartments during COVID and beyond. We've invested dollars in so-called middle income housing, where we've allowed developers to get subsidized for projects that may not pencil out 
to their appraised price by going forward. We have done things that have never been done in our state before, primarily because of the federal dollars. And now that the federal dollars have disappeared or have gone away, we're relying on the tax dollars that we bring in, which are much harder to come by and are at the core of a lot of the conversation we'll hear tonight about the change in money coming into the state. So my feeling generally about uh, running again is that not only do I get to do this policy work on behalf of Vermonters, find a way to make this place more affordable at a time when everybody is stressed out financially, we are going to find a way to continue those conversations, but it's also constituent work. You know, the work I do when people call, when you call me and you need help with the government, when you need help with a program, that's one of the more important jobs that we do, especially here during this um, off season. So I feel like I've represented us well. I feel like there's a lot to say, there's a lot to, to, to show on my, my resume, but more importantly, I just want to put across that this job has been the best job I've ever had, but it's also been the hardest job I've ever had. And I really appreciate the privilege, and I've always appreciated the privilege of serving you. Um, finally, I just want to thank Elizabeth for setting this up. I want to thank um, my family for supporting this for all the years that I've been doing this. Um, my wife doesn't just sit at home and answer the phone for me. She's out right now working down at the, at the office building on behalf of people who were affected by the flood. And it's a family affair, it's a family teamwork, and we do it because we love this community. So thank you for the time, and we'll talk to you, I guess, in an hour. <laughs> Thank you, Roger. Um, good evening, everyone. My name is Teresa Wood. Um, shout out to Elizabeth. Thank you for organizing this, and thank you to all of you for being here tonight. Um, it's a, a great opportunity to hear from so many people in one spot. So thank you for making the time in your in your lives to be here tonight. Um, I'm a lifelong resident, and I, I kind of prepared some remarks just because I didn't want to forget anything, and I wanted to move it along, and uh, you know, we can tend to ramble when we have a microphone in our hands, so excuse that. Um, I'm a lifelong resident of Waterbury. I grew up uh, as a young person on Randall Street and had many fine years there, and I currently live on Perry Hill. I served in the legislature for nine years. I was first appointed by Governor Shumlin to fill the unexpired term of Rebecca Ellis when she took a position with the Agency of Natural Resources. And then I've been reelected four times since then. In my first year, I served on the Corrections and Institutions Committee. And prior to my service in the legislature, I served as Deputy Commissioner of the Department of Disabilities, Aging, and Independent Living as a community liaison with the Agency of Transportation to link VTRANS with local community uh, issues on a number of transportation projects like when the roundabout was built, uh, when uh, Route 100 was uh, rebuilt, when we resurfaced Route 2 and the bridge overpasses at exit 10. I was chair of Rebuild Waterbury after Tropical Storm Irene and I've also currently chair of the House Human Services Committee and have served in that role for the last two years. Uh, I've also been appointed to additional responsibilities by the Speaker of the House, including the Joint Legislative Management Committee, the Joint Justice Oversight Committee, which oversees corrections issues during the off session. I'm a member of the Joint Fiscal Committee, which provides oversight of the state budget and approves grants received by the state. And uh, in uh, an unprecedented responsibility, I was appointed three times to the final negotiations on the state budget as one of three members of the House on the Budget Conference Committee. I say unprecedented because uh, those three slots are normally filled by all Appropriations Committee members and uh, because of my responsibility on the House Human Services Committee and Human Services being the largest state agency in state government and my background uh, in this area, I was happy to be able to do that and to 
provide um, that service. I'm very happy to be here tonight and I really um, it will enjoy hearing from you all and thank you for the opportunity to be here and the opportunity to serve you in the legislature. Republican candidate, John Griffin. Just calling me out like that, right? No. <laughs> um, thank you, everybody. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here this evening. Um, obviously, I do not serve in the legislature, so I wanted to tell you a little bit about myself. And I think that that time limit was probably set just for me. Somebody must have talked to my wife. So, um, John Griffin, I grew up in Vermont, um, my central Vermont verse here. I went to the University of Vermont for civil engineering, got my bachelor's degree, and then I started working for VTrans in 2010. So I was there for the first flood of Irene, and then for these most recent two. So I've been around and watching a lot of infrastructure. Most of my experience with, with uh, the type of events we've experienced has been mostly bridge, bridge related. So um, I do have a little bit of experience related to responding to these emergencies, and I can feel for everybody in all those communities that are impacted. I don't know if you guys can hear me in the back or not. I, I can't really hear you. All right. Sorry about that. Um, so that's a little bit about me. I'm a father of three kids, seven, five, and two. So education is near and dear to my heart. Uh, we own our home, so obviously the cost of education is near and dear to my heart as well. Um, child care is another big one. Given that our kids are so young, I mean, we spent almost $36,000 in child care last year. So that is something that's not sustainable. Um, a lot of families can't can't afford that. We we're fortunate that we were able to because I worked two jobs. I've worked two jobs for eight years. So I feel the financial pain that people feel. I feel the grind that people feel. And I've just felt like I wanted to get involved to really focus on affordability. And, and I know that's a, a, probably a, a, you know, a hot topic because it depends on what is affordable. What are your priorities? And everybody has different priorities. So as a representative, I would want to hear from you. That's why tonight is so important to me. Um, because I'm not representing myself, I'd be representing the community and the constituents. So um, what is of value to me may not be of value to you, but that's important that I hear from the constituents and that I represent the people of our parents. Um, so I'm just happy to be here. I really want to listen. Um, I do not have a legislative agenda. I'm not a politician. Um, this is really awkward for me with my family of being so young. It's challenging with the two jobs I have. And it's something that um, is, is really more of a hardship than it is um, something that I want to pursue. But I feel it's important to be involved. And you know, um, if you don't participate, in my opinion, you, you can't really complain. So you guys are all here participating, so I want to thank you for that. Um, and with that, I just want to thank Elizabeth for setting it up. And I'm really interested to hear what's important to you. And if you guys have questions for me, I'll, I'll keep those in the, the mental repertoire for the end so I can try and answer them to the best of my ability. I echo that I'm really glad to see so many of you turning out this evening. I think it's really important for us all to be voicing and to participating. Um, there's obviously a lot of energy going on across the nation, but certainly here in our state, and this is what we can focus on. Um, so for those of you who don't know me, I'm Elizabeth Brown. I live up on Perry Hill. I've been a member of the community for about 18 years. I've got a husband over here who's helping out with the acoustics, and uh, an 11-year-old and a 16-year-old. Uh, I was recently appointed to the school board as we had three positions that were opened, uh, so I took that position back in April. And uh, I've been a working mother, you know, so I understand the grind and the hardship when you have two working parents and what that feels like. Um, and I was lucky enough uh, in December to leave a demanding corporate job after 22 years and have been now since then running my consulting practice, which has allowed me freedom and time, which is the only reason why I'm able to even consider this, because I think for most people, they're too busy working to even consider being able to take a position to represent in the state house. So I've been paying attention quite closely the last couple of years as to what's been going on in the State House. Um, I would say with some concern and more recently with anger. And I think the quote has gone around, which is a true statement. I looked at my husband in January. I said, I need to get involved or we need to leave. And I have spent my whole entire adult life here in Vermont. I came up here in 96 to go to the University of Vermont. I've been, as I say, exporting my services outside of the state because it is very hard to make ends meet and to find fulfilling work here. I think that is something that we need to change. I've been watching as a financial services professional for the cost of living to go through the roof here. 
And it has been questioned, how could I, as a Democratic woman, be also focused on affordability? Affordability, to me, is the number one issue we have going on in our state right now. Democratic values say that they stand for education, affordability, looking out for the working class, those people who are struggling, housing, retirement, health care. And when I look at what has gone on in the past 10 to 20 years here, if you look at all of these, housing, I'm going to use Greensboro as an example. That's a $10 million project going up there, 20 units attached to the town hall. That's 500 k per unit. That is not affordable housing. Or health care. It's very hard to get those appointments you need. Those costs are going through the roof. Or property tax bills just hit. That is not affordable. People cannot stay in their homes the direction that we're going. The education system. We all know that, that we have the second most expensive education in the country right now. 20 years ago, we had excellent scores. We had excellent performance. We are mid-range right now. And I know our teachers are struggling. I know our schools are struggling. And I also know, and I dove into this, there's been a ton of research, a ton of committees over the past 10 years or more indicating this train wreck was going to happen. What you were experiencing in terms of your property tax bill should never have happened. And it pitted communities against each other. Students, my own children were coming home and saying, why is our community not supporting us? That is not OK. So. Am I a registered Democrat? That question has come up. I'm not, I'm not registered as anything. I never have been. I am not a politician. I'm a working mother, a concerned citizen. We have the civilian legislature. That is why I'm running. Also, the question has come up about my donors. When it came up back in May, June, that there was a banker who was interested, who understands financial services, a financial services leader who was interested in running, you betcha this went viral. And people got behind me. And that included Republicans. It includes actually progressives. I've got people the full spectrum behind me all over the state and also outside of this state. So if you actually look at that donor list, I have got colleagues, friends, family who are all donating to me and getting behind me. And that also includes Vermonters who are vested in our community who live outside of the state half of the year. That is also common. So I know these questions have come up about me. I want you to look at me as a candidate with the passion and the experience that is required for us to create the change we need. Okay, now it's time for all of you to voice your comments, your questions, your concerns. And you can step right up to this podium. Uh, each person will have two minutes. Amy will wave uh, when those two minutes are up, and we just ask you to wrap it up within the, oh, look at that. She's got a 30 second. <laughs> you see her waving that 30 seconds? You know what that means. I can go. Okay, so right up over here. Cool. And, and I'll just ask everyone. So, so actually, these. Yeah, if you just uh, state your name and where you live. Uh, so, just turn it on. thank you so much. Hola, everybody hear me? Okay, good. So my name is Constancia Gomez, and actually I'm from Argentina, and I'm a teacher. Uh, last year I taught at um, Cross Brook, Spanish. And actually it's amazing because I came 25 years ago to this valley, and I was like, oh, this is great, this is great. Oh, and then I had a kid. I was like, uh, wrong country. Because my friends that went to Europe, of course, they had so much help, and the, you know the government pays you 70 percent for the women to go back to work. But what happened here? And actually, I don't think that should be that difficult to figure that out. Uh, but you know what? What do I know? I'm from Argentina, and Argentina, you guys, Americans. I mean, I'm American too. Sorry, but you guys are what the first world country, or we are not, right? So we can't. Tell. But we won the World Cup. Ta -da -da. <laughs> Woo, everybody, yeah, give it up. So, and then we won, we won yesterday or two days ago. Who knows? Who cares? But like, let's do this, people. And I think that, I think that there's enough money to have every single kid, even doing Spanish or French, when they are five years in, in how do you say, in care. So anyway, that's that. Thank you. Is that a, Thank you. All right. Hi, Wilda White. Uh, I live. 
Hi, my name is Wilda White. I live in uh, Waterbury, Waterbury Center, uh, off Ruby Raymond Road. I have a question for Elizabeth. Um, I appreciate your analysis of the problem. I tend to agree with you. I'm curious about what you would do uh, if you were elected um, to tackle any of those issues, given your one vote uh, in, in the legislature. We're not taking questions <laughs> till the end. Yeah, uh, again, just to remind people, you're not gonna get answers to your questions right away. They're gonna have five minutes at the end to recap everything that they heard. But this is not a back and forth, this is your, your chance to voice your concerns, what you think we should be talking about within the community. Sorry, I came in late, so I didn't hear the rules. Okay, so, so yeah, my concerns are lack of, it's definitely affordability. I'm, uh, I, I, you know, I'm past retirement age, still working, and I, would, I am not able to, to afford to retire here, so I'm interested in that. Housing is a challenge. Um, I'm also uh, not happy with the way our legislature is handling the um, drug issue in our state. I think uh, that there's, in this last legislative session, there was a lot of attention paid to overdose, which is, I think is appropriate but not enough attention paid to the, the externalities of drug use, such as theft, um, retail theft, uh, violence, uh, and I just think the balance is, has tipped way too much to just ignoring uh, the societal cost, because drug use is not a victimless crime, unfortunately. Um, and so I appreciate the sensitivity to uh, people who are using drugs, but I also would appreciate some sensitivity to the people who are harmed um, by people who are using drugs. Thank you. Uh, good evening, I'm Duncan McDougal, live in Waterbury Center. I want to thank all of the four candidates for being willing to run for office. I know it's a tremendous commitment of time and energy, so thank you. Um, as we have seen over the past year, uh, we, we've been flooded three times in this town, and a lot of folks have either been flooded or have been helping their neighbors muck out. Uh, I personally believe climate change is human caused. I believe it's an existential threat to our planet, to our state, and if nothing else, uh, we just need to look at the costs that are involved. You know, when you get flooded three times, and some of them are even bigger than others, there are gonna be tens of thousands of dollars that are gonna need to be paid for repairs and, and just for recovery. So it's a really important issue. I would love each of you at the end in your time to answer these questions. One is, do you believe climate change is human caused? Uh, and if so, what do you think uh, Vermont should do um, to fight it? Thank you very much. All right, next up. There we go, Mike. You go first. Uh, Dick Patterson, I live on Blush Hill, Waterbury. Lived in Duxbury, Waterbury all my life. Looking around at the people that are here, I, I think everybody's going to have the same thoughts that I do. Um, <clears throat> when I had my first child, I didn't expect anybody to help with childcare. That was our responsibility. My mom was sick a few years ago. I didn't ask for any help. We didn't expect any help. The family took care of her. So some of the programs you're seeing, they're niceties, but you know, when I was working, I made $2 an hour. Interest rates were 18%. So what we see today, it's not so bad when you, when you look at it that way. What I, what I don't like is another point four four cents coming out of somebody's paycheck to help somebody take care of their kids. That's not right, that's their responsibility. And just by the way, the tax bill that I just got took about 75% of my last year's 3.2% Social Security increase, say it got. So, how do I spend the rest of it? That's for you guys to help me figure out. <laughs> Good evening. 
Mike Bard, um, Waterbury. Uh, thank you all for running. I know it's always tough to run for political office, but it's nice to have some competition in, in, in the race. I do want to bring up the elephant in, in the room, which I'm sure a lot of people will be discussing. Uh, we have a total affordability crisis. And don't get me wrong, I'm very pro-education, but our school system is broken. We had 14% increase, and the legislature found that acceptable. I think there are a lot of people on fixed income who are not finding that acceptable. Uh, in the future, we're going to see increase all increases similar to that in our tax bill. It's going to drive Vermonters out of this state because we can't afford to live here. For both the folks who are currently in the legislature and the ones who want to be, I just want to ask you, I don't like the supermajority that's just going along and voting through budgets that are not affordable. I know I'm a selectman in the town of Waterbury. We keep our budget fairly close to neutral, and the town's not, but your town tax bill is a small portion of what your, um, your, your total property tax bill. Property taxes are going to, uh, you know, really have a detrimental effect, push more people into poverty, and drive a lot of folks out of town. And I would love to hear all your thoughts on how you're going to change that. Thank you. All right. Um, I just got a message here from Melissa Johnson. Melissa, are you here? Chairs are in the hall if anyone needs them, thanks to Gary Dillon. I brought another rack up. So apologies to the candidates as we've been wrestling in the back. Okay, uh, we can take a moment, I think. Anyone that would like to go get a chair and bring it forward and uh, be able to sit for the rest of the meeting is welcome to go down the hall and go pick one up. Well, there's four empty ones right here. Nobody's jumping on it, so. Okay, well, I guess we got enough chairs. Uh, all right, who's next? Come on, W. Bashful, MK, come on. Uh, yeah, no, Chris and MK. No, wait. Okay. Before May. MK Monley, I live in Waterbury Center. How long we lived there? 36 years, I think. Um, I just want to say I appreciate the work that Tom and Teresa have done. I appreciate your timely responses to my emails and my concerns. And um, I do think you're looking out for all of us. And I don't think you have an easy job. And I don't, I don't want to lose you. I really appreciate the work you're doing. Thanks. Yeah, thank you. Home ownership. Supposed to be the American dream. Born and raised here. My wife essentially raised here. Her father was a uh, military man, so she moved back. They moved back when she was three years old. Together, we have worked our ever loving butts off in this community, staying here, not going somewhere else. When it came time to build a home, or buy a home, unlike probably many of you in here, I didn't have the ability to just go down the road and say, that one's for say, I think, sale, I think I'll take it. I had to build my home with these two hands, these shoulders, this back. So my connection to my home is very near and dear to me. And at this point in time, I'm at $25,000 property taxes on my place up here in the center. You used to look at your home as being an asset. Now, quite frankly, I think a lot of people are looking at it as being a liability. Because this year alone, I'm going to be faced with a potential $5,000 increase. One fifth of what has taken me 35 years to get to. 
And well, like I said to the select board one night, I'm looking down the barrel of two choices if this keeps up. Selling my home and having to get the hell out or let my house go up for tax sale. I want to ask you, what kind of choices are those? Something is amiss up at the state house. It's almost sounding cynical that they're willing to accept the collateral damage of pushing people, working class Vermonters, out of their home, knowing full well that there's going to be somebody from out of state with deeper pockets that are going to scoop that house up, knowing that they can afford the narrative and the, and the agenda that's being pushed at the state house. I'm here to tell you right now, I'm not selling my home, and you're not taking it and over my dead body. So you better figure it out. Thank you. My name is John Threlkill, and I, I live at uh, Wood Farm Road in Waterbury Center. And I'm really concerned about affordability also. Can you hold your mic up a little higher? Yeah. Okay. Thank How's you. that? Good. And, it, and it's not just the fact that there, lo there may very well be a wealthy out-of-stater who can come in and, and take these properties over. But who's going to maintain your car? Who's going to maintain your house? Who's going to take care of your grandparents or your, your parents if you need help. Um, the the so-called working class are going to get driven out of the state and you won't be able to go to a restaurant and find somebody to uh, wait on you. Um, not that that's a critical thing, but um, it's, it's really getting to the point where it's a crisis, the shit is hitting the fan, and I think the legislature has to look at cost. All I ever hear you people talking about is raising taxes. That's it. Where's the income coming from? You never talk about, not that I see, cutting cost, using attrition in the workforce, uh, combining departments. I know there's a lot of efficiencies. You've got a, a Vermont Manufacturing Extension Center that you could bring in, you could do some value stream mapping, you could figure out where all the waste is, you could make things much more efficient, but I don't think you guys really understand how that could possibly work. And that's what it's going to take to cut cost, is to combine departments, cut departments, um, and I think it could all be done through attrition. It could be done over time, but it's got to start. And so I just, you know, I'm fine. I'm retired. I sold a company. Um, financially, I'm fine. But I'm really concerned about the people that worked on my house. I grew up in construction, you know, one foot in the blue collar world and one foot in the white collar world, if you will. And I'm really concerned about all the people who are just barely making it. They're, they're barely making it now. And, and what are they going to do if this keeps up? So anyways, that's, that's all I got to say. Well, it's interesting you said that because I've got some answers on efficiency and cutting costs. As a principal for 20 some years, I was 13 years at Thatcher Brook. My first principal job was at Waterville. I had 87 students as a principal. <clears throat> I did five interim positions in small schools as a principal. The issue with cutting costs should happen in education of not having micro schools. When I read the school board was not going to close the middle school at Harwood, that did it for me. To make that kind of decision that we're not going to close that school, talk about efficiency, wherever John went, <laughs> he disappeared in the crowd. But that, that, that's what's hurting Vermont. There were 18 school districts in Waterbury at one time. My gosh, we survived it now that there's only one. Now there is only one district in the valley. We need to not have micro schools. Thatcher Brook seems like a big school. Naturally, it's not. I don't think it was an impersonal you know, monolith of a school for students and parents to go there. But to have schools of 24, 60 students with a you know, full-time principal is unsustainable. 
to have superintendents, as many as we have. I left Thatcher Brook because I had a meddling superintendent who was doing the job that I was supposed to do because it wasn't enough for that person to do. There shouldn't be that much expenses at superintendent level in small schools. Can you hear me? Uh, I'm Rick Boyle. I live on Randall Street. And, uh, I'm a Flint survivor. And I want to thank the entire community for everything you've done for Randall Street and residents and, and beyond. I know there's a lot of people that are affected. It's not just Randall Street, although we're always on the news. Um, so flood, flooding is, is a statewide problem. And um, it's a national problem, really. Uh, and, and it was brought up earlier, this should be about community issues, which is just ridiculous because, you know, we, we, can, we can just focus on little community issues, but we are affected by national issues. You know, national regulations about how they fill in wetlands, uh, national regulations about how you uh, build a house in, uh, in certain areas and, and, uh, and uh, regulations on how you um, mitigate uh, water runoff, for instance. These are all impact us. Um, this whole community is impacted greatly, and I'd like the candidates to talk about what they think they could do to help mitigate future flooding. Um, I think after Irene, we were all in shock, but then after that, it was, uh, you know, it was getting out of people's minds for a while, and then suddenly it rears its head again, and, and everybody says, well, what has happened? What, what did they do since Irene, you know, what are we preparing ourselves for? Um, so I'd like to hear about that. The other thing is a lot of people are talking about affordability and cost increases and darn right, um, we're all struggling. And um, I think it's um, almost disingenuous to put, point the blame at the legislature and taxes. You know, very few people are complaining about their health, well, I mean, every people complain about it, but there's not as much ire about your health care and how it's gone up, um, the housing costs that have gone up to buy a house in the first place, child care that's gone up, extraordinarily gone up. I, I'm with you, man. I, I paid that too. Um, uh, education. All these affordability issues are what are squeezing people and making this place and, and this whole country unaffordable. I mean, let's face it. This is not just a tax issue. These people don't talk about corporate power and what it's doing to them and how it's affecting their lives as much as they do taxes. And that's just ridiculous. In fact, I see a lot of the work that you guys are trying to do is trying to find ways to mitigate that, to, to advocate for around the corporate interests, which we know get great tax breaks too. So I'd really like to see something more done for the people. And lastly, um, I just my quick, I would like people to talk about ranked choice voting. Ranked choice voting is selecting a candidate, not the lesser of the evil, choosing between two ridiculous candidates that nobody wants, but really putting your preference out of who you think is the best for a, a particular uh, position. And if your candidate doesn't win, then that candidate's eliminated, and it's kind of like another round. People who are still in it, their candidate stays in it, and they keep going until you get a democracy. You get you get over 50% of the people believing that person should be the candidate. So that's all I have to say. Thank you. Hi. Kaya Winchell Como, a 45-year resident in Waterbury, uh, married to a lifelong Vermonter that works at Husky in, in Milton. Uh, a lot of you may know me either from the radio station or working at the town office. Here's my situation. 1970s house valued at 184000 Told I could probably put it on the market for three eighty five, dollars which I think is just ridiculous. My taxes now are over $5,000 a year. Just had 18 inches of water go through the side yard, thinking about maybe calling Chris or another person to come and repair it, but I know Chris is busy with much bigger uh, projects around town. Never had a child go to the school system, so $4,000 of my taxes go to a school system I've never used. What do I pay? 
Do I pay my $5,000 taxes? Do I pay somebody like Chris or another contractor to come and repair my yard, which is probably going to flood again in December, so I'll have to go through it all over again. And then next summer, uh, in 12 years at my house, Guptal Road, my little area, has taken, taken a beating four times. I expect it to be taken a beating again in December. So my question is, what do I do? What do I pay? Do I pay my $4,000 to Harwood in the school system? Do I, I pay for repair work to my damaged yard? Or do I get up and sell the house for three eighty five dollars and move to Tennessee or North Carolina? Because living here, mm, not cutting it anymore. Uh, thank you for your time. Okay. I'd like to appreciate Mike for being the first member of the select board to speak so I didn't have to. I said I would like to thank Mike Bard for being the first member of the select board to speak so I didn't have to be. Um, my question comes, um, as, as many of you know, I ran on affordability and affordable housing and I'm well versed in Tom and Teresa's stances on the matter. Um, my question is more about campaign rhetoric. Vermonters typically don't run mean campaigns. They speak about how what they will do to change things, not how someone else is screwing up. So my question is a little bit of a uh, rhetorical hand grenade um, and I'm directed at Elizabeth. I'm sorry. Um, how do you justify your rhetoric regarding the inaffordability of property taxes when the vote at the school board level to increase our taxes substantially was an aye? It's a unanimous vote, which means that Elizabeth herself voted to give us that budget that we inevitably passed that raised the property taxes. That is my question. Thank you. Yeah, that's Kane Sweeney. Good evening, and thank all of you, our two uh, representatives. I'm sorry, I didn't tell you. Yeah, you know my name. You. I know, sorry. <laughs> Mary Cohen, I live on Park Street and have for 16 years. I um, appreciate our representatives, Tom and Teresa. I know how hard they work. And I echo what Kane said. Please, can we lower the temperature? Do we have to attack another person to make our case? That has been awful in Front Porch Forum. And doesn't mean people here are doing it, but we've got to stop it. I appreciate the two new candidates and you're stepping up and making a case for what you can offer. That's all important. We need to hear a good race has opponents. And that's fine. But I haven't heard anything, and affordability is an issue for me. I, too, tell by my gray hair, am retired. And it's hard. The property tax bill was a shock. I'm also a retired educator and have worked in Vermont public schools for 40 years, 30 years in public schools, 10 years for the state as a special ed director for the Department of Corrections. So our, our taxes go to common good. Educating our children in whatever size schools is really important. And I believe Vermont is the culture here is in large part, maybe I, Don's right, 87 students with a principal, we probably need to work on it. Uh, we probably needed to change that, but I'm not so sure all this consolidation. But that's, that's neither here nor there. But losing sight of the fact that our children are being educated by teachers and supported by all kinds of support staff in a way that they can grow and achieve. We've, we've got incredible graduates doing incredible things from this district. And it does cost money, and it's hard. And I also want to say that I, 
part of my master's degree, part of my certificate for planning and administration to be able to work in administration in public schools. Vermont's affordability around school taxes has always been an issue. And the confusion and the grand list and the, um, what, what am I trying to say, that unified pupil, whatever, has always been sort of a mystery. And I, I, don't, I don't blame Tom and Teresa or anyone else who has um, served as a legislator, worked as a public servant. But it, but it is an issue to, be, to work on. But it all comes down to what, what about the common good? So my question for all four of you is how are you going to balance the role of government, your role as a legislature, and this real, very real issue of affordability? Thank you. Again, uh, just to remind people, uh, Amy's going to be waving uh, the 30 second uh, <laughs> tablet there when you have 30 seconds left. So try to take that as a clue to uh, wrap your, uh, your comments. Thanks. Hello, I'm Jim Riley. <coughs> Um, I'm a Southern transplant from Rhode Island, been living in Vermont since 2012. Uh, with your permission, I would like. Uh, oh yes. Oh, gotcha. Uh, so anyhow, uh, with your permission, I'd like to speak on behalf of somebody who lives in this district. I'm just outside, uh, if that would be okay. Uh, they weren't able to be here. I'm speaking on behalf of Alan and James Grace, who live in Waterbury with their children. Quotes, when we were 20 weeks pregnant, we began looking for child care and had to piece together care for two years for our youngest, often driving an hour or more for child care. Act 76 supported 35 new child care spaces in Stowe, and our family was able to get a spot after the two-year wait. Child care has been essential for our family, allowing us to work without the headache of inconsistent and faraway care. Public funding through Act 76 is already lowering families' child care costs, creating jobs and better compensation for educators, and increasing child care cap cap capacity statewide. But the job is not done. Educators are still underpaid and turnover is high. Families are still struggling to afford child care, and thousands of child care spaces are still needed to meet current demand. If we're concerned as a community about making it possible for people to live, work, and thrive here, or as I've heard from our own local leaders about developing an increasing tax revenue, then child care must continue to be a priority for our community. If elected, what would, be, what would you do uh, as our representative to ensure that Act 76 works the way our communities need it to do? Thank you. Thanks, Hi, um, I'm Robbie Adler. I live in Waterbury Center with uh, two daughters, uh, one in Brookside and one not quite in Brookside. Um, I also recently joined the planning commission in town. Um, I want to thank all four of you for both running, make, allowing for a conversation, giving us choice um, to both of our existing reps. I've reached out to you, you're responsive. Elizabeth, I've reached out to you, you're responsive. Having that level of dialogue with our representatives is just deeply appreciative and it's the way our, our democracy should work. I do have a question just about this, uh, you know, affordability, investing in our kids and education and trying to strike that right balance. Um, there was a law that passed, I think two legislative sessions ago, Act 127, that impacted how uh, local property taxes that were collected here were then sent to Montpelier and redistributed back to each district. Um, and from what I understand is it basically negatively impacted our district, meaning we are, uh, our property taxes are being collected, going to Montpelier, and we're basically getting fewer of those dollars back due to Act 127. I think both uh, Representative Stevens and uh, Representative Wood, you voted for that. Uh, and I think we were faced coming into this budget session where uh, you know, we had multiple budgets that got voted down. My kids had you know, teachers getting cut, uh, programs getting cut. 
Um, so we're kind of doing the opposite of investing in the next generation. All of us went, or many of us went to public schools. Our communities invested in our kids. I think it's important we continue to invest in our kids. But I also think our representatives need to be representing the best interests of our community. It's unclear to me how Act 127 did that. And I'm curious just you know, to hear more about your decision to support that bill. All right, next up. Hi, I'm Danny Kelman. I live in Waterbury. Um, thank you all for being here, and thanks to our um, neighbors and friends for being here. I John, appreciate what you said about getting involved if you have something to say. And I want to remind us all that it is an absolute privilege to have the time to be here, to have childcare or to not have to work. And so we might have complaints and might not have the privilege of being involved. So whether you are a representative, a potential representative, or a voter, I think it's really important to keep that in mind. Um, we talk a lot about uh, the headlines that we're reading. And some of us have the time and knowledge and um, ability to understand the, the depth of what's going on at the State House. A lot of us don't. I have been involved in politics um, and policy, and I still don't always understand what I'm reading. So what I'd love to hear a little bit more is um, Tom and Teresa about what's happening or what happened um, with the vote and the tax increase, because I think we see headlines and it's very upsetting, but we might not understand the details or be able to go deeper. So I'd love to hear from that. Um, Elizabeth, when uh, later when you're speaking, I would love to hear some policies. I've heard a lot of like broad generalizations because that's what you hear from constituents, what they're concerned about. But I love to hear, as another folk said, what are you planning to do about it? What is a, a policy stance that you have? Um, and then also you said you had the experience needed for this position. I don't see that from just learning about you. But again, we haven't sat down one-on-one, -on -one, so I and I think others would love to hear that a little bit more. I also want to remind us that change can be really, really good, especially I think we get really excited about change when we're frustrated and angry and feel stuck. But change for change's sake is not always the best options, sometimes patience, sometimes asking a little bit more, a little bit different from the folks who are there could get us where we want to go better than just change because we feel stuck. Um, and so that's something I'd like to remind us as well. The other thing is we talk about division. I know I'm almost out of time. Um, but then we talk about working class and white collar and blue collar. And that is emphasizing division. We are all citizens of this district um, and we are all doing the best we can regardless of the jobs that we have regardless of our income etc um, so just remember that sometimes we complain about division and then make it a little bit worse so thank you all for being here and i appreciate your time all right next up uh sir you were i think you hi my name is landall cochran and i'm from huntington anyone else here from huntington tonight yeah, no problem. Uh, we were going to have one of these last, last week, uh, but we had a little flood, uh, so we canceled it. Uh, so uh, I dressed up tonight because I mean business. Uh, I've been serving on the Huntington Select Board since 2018, and I'm running for the Senate seat in the Addison Senate District, which represents Huntington and all of Addison County. So not you folks here, uh, but I've been speaking a lot with Elizabeth, and I've been really impressed with her. And uh, I think the reason why she's in this is very similar to the reason why I'm in this here. I want to take a minute here to just go over two of the biggest issues and how some of the policies that the supermajority just gave us here uh, created the issues that we're talking about. The first one is school budgets. So what happens with school budgets essentially is that every budget in the state passes their budget, they send their budget to Montpelier, they do a lot of redistribution between the districts. And then they send the tax bills out to everyone. So essentially, we have a blank check funding model for education where people from one part of the state can write checks for the money of people in the other part of the state. That has to stop. We have to set the funding pool for education funding before the school budgets are done. That's the solution to that problem. That's the reason why it happened. Unfortunately, the supermajority was blindsided by the mathematical impact of the redistributions that they made in 2022. And now we're all suffering for it. Uh, the second thing I wanted to go over is affordable housing. So two big things just hit. Uh, we had some new uh, building standards go into effect on July 1st uh, that make uh, 
building homes have to be more energy efficient, which is not a bad thing, but it does mean building homes are now more, more expensive than they were last month. Uh, the other thing is the updates to Act 250 just made developing land in rural areas more difficult and more expensive. So when we talk about affordable housing, we have to allow Vermonters to build their own houses in affordable ways in rural areas. That is the essence of Vermont. That's what people want, is to live in small towns. So this single-sided approach to taking, taking all the affordable housing emphasis and putting it into one of 10 population areas in the state is not going to work. That's only one part of the problem. We need to continue doing that, but we need to also empower people to build in rural areas. We need to reinvigorate our rural communities that don't have jobs, they don't have businesses, but they do have the space. Why? We're overregulated. We need to do something about it. So I decided I'd put my name in. Uh, I'm running for the Senate district, uh, but I, uh, I'm very interested to hear uh, some new ideas because unfortunately, what we've got from the supermajority, it isn't working for us. Tom and Teresa, I think you're fine, folks. I thank you for your service. I'm ready to try a new plan. Thank you. Yeah. We'll be back there. I'm Eliza Novick Smith. I live up in Waterbury Center. Um, and before I forget, I would echo Danny's question to the group about Tom and Teresa have the benefit or misfortune, depending on your perspective, I guess, of having a policy record that we can judge. Um, but for the folks who are running for the first time who are not politicians, although that is the job you are running for, so I'm, I'm not sure how not wanting to be a politician qualifies you for this job that you are applying for. Um, your job will become, if you succeed, to do policy making work, which is different than the work that you have been doing, I think, and perhaps your experience will be useful in the work of policy making, but specific policies are the thing you will have to do on day one when you get there. And the concern that is in this room about things needing to change will require you to be able to do that nimbly, um, your values will not, will only be so useful in getting that, those translated into policy will be the only thing that matters. Um, and I, I, well, I will speak for only myself. I'm interested in knowing more about what that, how, you're, how you would translate your values into actual policies because that is where the rubber meets the road for all of your constituents. Um, and I want to just say, I'm a younger person, I'm a young person, um, and affordability matters for me as well. I work for the state, I work in law enforcement. I want to just say some things that my perspective is different than some of the folks who have spoken. Um, my department is chronically understaffed. We never have enough people to help us do all of the work to enforce the laws that the legislature passes. Uh, then, then there are people coming in the door who need our attention. I can most of my paycheck and my husband's paycheck, respectfully, we don't live in a world anymore where only one of us can work and one of us can watch our children. That world does not exist anymore. A tremendous amount of our resources that we bring in on two incomes, I'm a public servant, my husband is a therapist, um, goes to paying for our housing costs, paying for our health insurance costs. Um, and those things matter to us too, but so does having schools here. If we were to live here and want to have a family, we need to be able to have schools that we could send our potential future children to um, and places to send them to before they're old enough to be in school. And those services are expensive. And I think it's easy to say affordability, but you're talking about things that just cost a lot of money. That's why these things are hard. All right. Go. Good evening, I'm Joe Camerata. I live up on Maple Street in Waterbury Center, but I'm here to comment tonight as chair of the Waterbury Housing Task Force. I'm not going to rehash the affordability issues. You know the numbers, you hear the emotion about that tonight. Um, while we do appreciate the progress that was made with the Home Acts last year and the reforms for 250, uh, this year we believe that will create opportunity for development of new housing in Waterbury. However, having that opportunity and capitalizing on that opportunity are two different things. 
And one of the challenges that we hear when we speak to people is how difficult it is to be a landlord in Vermont and how much risk the landlords take on themselves. And when you talk to landlords and you talk to people in this area, you find lots of stories about how tenants are gaming the system. They understand that, that, the, that it tilts in their favor, so they're gaming it with the landlords. And it's really required, it's really disincentivizing people, to, especially people to enter into the long-term rental market when it's so easy to just flip it into a short-term rental, make more money by putting it on Airbnb and not have to deal with the risks. Tom, you mentioned this issue in your recent post on Front Porch Forum that you were going to study this issue. I'd like to hear, uh, when I hear study coming from the government, that concerns me because that means not action. So I'd like to hear a little bit around the timeline for that and what you think we can do to, to incentivize landlords to come back to the long-term rental market. Thank you, Joe. Okay. Hello, uh, my name is Katie Gallagher. I live in Waterbury Center, and I will say proudly for only four years. Um, I am a young, newer resident. Came from Connecticut, and I'm not going back there. Please don't send me back there. Um, but I just want to say, as a younger person, um, echo what has been said previously, that it is a privilege to be able to get involved, it is a privilege to be able to live here. Um, I also know, after working for the past decade in community development and community engagement, that it is often um, a small group of people that show up for things and that are repeating the same things. And, and we need those voices, and that's important. But it is more challenging to reach those who are often more burdened, who are often younger, those who have families, who can't make a night meeting, who can't afford to come, um, who might be stuck at home. And I just um, would like to ask, I guess, how you ensure as an elected official that you are reaching everybody in the community and not just those who have the privilege to be here already and to show up. And thank you. I'll just uh, note that we're getting close to an hour, but uh, we've got time for a few more uh, speakers. So. Tom Glor, Waterbury. Uh, would say as a lifelong resident, spent 28 years out at Waterbury in the military. Um, Teresa, Tom, phenomenal job. Um, a lot of passion in this. I would say that um, the discussion about change is, is important. Um, there will be a time that we all have to face change. Um, I would say that as you listen to your constituents, I want to say that uh, for the two candidates running against the incumbents, game on. You, you need to keep it at, keep at it because I think that if you win, congratulations. If you don't, keep fighting. And, and I say that because for the incumbents, you should pay as much attention to those that don't vote for you. I think that's more important because there's this thing called groupthink. And, and I think we're kind of in there a little bit. I would ask that you, when you, uh, you've got a lot of people, a lot of motion, and, and you probably are writing some notes about how you're going to relate to, how you answer a question. Is this a question? The question is this. Think in terms of a Latin phrase I learned. I'm a Harwood Union graduate. Go Highlanders. Um, I learned from a history professor. He said, always think about cui bono, Latin phrase. Who's it good for? Who's it good for? Are you listening to the constituents? Are you listening to lobbyists? So when you answer your questions about this, this is one session, two hours? How many hours in a day? How many hours in a year? I would ask that whoever is elected come to the town meeting. And some people don't go, right? Because as Danny said, they can't go to town meeting. They can't go there. They don't have that luxury. Those that go there, though, want to hear from you, but they also want you to listen. So I would say spend a little bit more time uh, listening and less time talking. But, and I want to thank you again. And whoever does win, congratulations. And for those people here, how many people we have here? I don't know if I took a count. 
what's the voting population, the two incumbents of your constituents right now? Much more, right? Um, one last comment. I kind of have a business mindset. I have an army mindset. One thing to remember that privates watch everything. They know what leaders do. So what you do is important, not just what you say. Deeds, not words. Thank you. Thanks, Tom. All right, any others? Who to speak? Yes, sir. Hi, I'm Steve Martin. I've lived on Railroad Street almost my entire life, and I've lived in Waterbury my whole life. I'll take a few seconds of my time because uh, it's been brought up a couple of times and it, it may be correct. Uh, I have done a lot of posting on the Front Porch Forum and the Waterbury Roundabout, and I feel passionately about this. I feel that the state of Vermont, in many ways, is going in the wrong direction, and as a result of that, um, the um, concerns I've had over policies may have sometimes been um, what seemed like or perhaps were attacks on Tom Stevens and Teresa Wood. As far as I can tell, both of these are fine people and they've served the community and they, they have been reelected, so I guess they would think that everyone thinks they're doing what they should be doing. So if I, if I have, uh, cross that line any of these times, I apologize to both of you. Uh, aside from that, I'd like to echo a couple of things that, that folks have said. I lived here my whole life. Um, I don't recognize a lot of faces. I don't know if they're new faces or if they've been here forever because 50 to 60 hours a week of my life I spent working. My wife spent working. We had and raised two children and we paid for their meals and we paid for their childcare. And I understand this is all hard, um, but by my way of thinking, I don't think it's morally right because someone has a need that you have a claim to the, the um, work and earnings that other people have had. Vermonters are incredibly generous, and I'm sure Tom and Teresa and all the other folks in the legislature have stories that are heartbreaking every single day. But I also think you need logic and you need some command of finances and you need some balance and you need to weigh these things. And there's only a certain amount that it really is, there's so much talk about equity. Is it equitable to, to force people out of their home, homes that have lived here their entire life because they can't afford their property taxes? Is it equitable to take I don't know that this number is right, so I normally don't throw it out, but I've heard the number thrown out that there's like $40,000 per pupil spent in some parts of the state and 20000 in other parts. And I thought the Supreme Court had, had tried to say the legislature can't regulate everything, but they can take care of some of the financial part. Is that right, that, that perhaps your child gets a $20,000 fund and someone else's, it's all based on need. We cannot afford to spend all this money on the need of every single person. Some of this has got to come from hard work. And, uh, and I appreciate everything that folks are going through. That's my two cents. Thank you. Okay. Uh, take one more speaker. Thank you. Sure. All right. Hi, I'm Angela Hilfman. Um, I, for full disclosure, I do work for Let's Grow Kids, but I'm here as a Waterbury resident and a mom of a two-year-old. Um, I was not able to secure childcare for my son until he was about a year and a half old. Um, and I very much felt forced out of my former employment because I couldn't swing a nine to five without access to childcare. Um, <laughs> forgive me. So it's a little bit ironic that to get the flexibility to work full time and provide for my family without childcare, I literally had to work for the state's childcare campaign. Um, when I did secure childcare, uh, it was in South Burlington. A full time spot was in South Burlington. So my son and I would spend an hour and a half, 
five days a week in the car, um, which was heartbreaking as a mom because that significantly cut into our quality time together. Act 76 funding allowed an expansion down the road in Stowe, which cut our commute in half, so he and I are both much happier. Um, but it also supported families like mine. We heard from one Waterbury family. There's at least three other Waterbury families in his class that didn't have childcare before, local access to local childcare before their child turned two. His lead teacher lives in Waterbury, so it also created jobs in our community. And so I just want to reemphasize that the public funding that we're putting into childcare directly supports the families that live here, and it directly supports jobs and it directly supports our state economy, and I'm so incredibly grateful for that. So um, thank you for those who do support public investment in our communities. I know it can be hard, but it does pay off. So thank you. Okay, thanks uh, to everyone who came forward and uh, voiced your concerns, uh, your appreciations, uh, and uh, all the other comments we heard. Now we're going to give uh, each candidate five minutes uh, to uh, <laughs> tell us what they heard, give us the answers that were asked for. Uh, if they, I guess we could probably uh, stretch it to seven minutes if, if we really need to, uh, but. We'll, we'll be cutting you off at seven minutes, okay? Uh, let's uh, go in reverse order. Sure. Thanks, Roger. Um, I guess I'm supposed to stand up again, right? I took copious notes. Those were, it was fantastic feedback, and I really appreciate everyone who took the time to speak today. I have it on. It's great. Okay. Sounds good. Appreciate all the feedback and everyone taking the time to provide that feedback. And I also know that providing feedback, thank you, <laughs> uh, is difficult to do. And not all of us are comfortable talking in front of a group. And so that did come up that it is important to have various means to provide communication. I think all of us here probably have our information out there, whether it be our phone numbers or emails. There are various other ways. And as a candidate, I am in the process of launching a survey as well as some Zoom calls as well, because I do know that this is not always convenient for people to provide feedback. And it is incredibly important for you all to have a voice. Um, so I'm going to go through a couple of the questions. First, I really appreciate someone pointing out that I didn't really go over my experience well enough before. I apologize for that. So uh, I did spend 22 years in business and financial services and banking. Most recently is at TIAA, which is a very large not-for-profit organization uh, founded by Andrew, Andrew Carnegie, uh, Teachers Insurance Annuity Association. It was founded to help teachers retire with dignity. So even though I'm the big bad banker sometimes, people want to put me in that category, I was actually responsible for consumer strategy, retail strategy, to help people in the not-for-profit sector to achieve financial wellness is where I've spent the past seven years. And so my experience is not just in, well, it wasn't strategic planning, but it was applicable most especially to um, a lot of the people we're talking about who we're trying to serve here in our communities are those people who are working and struggling right now. Um, so I, I believe that experience in financial services and on my way in and out of uh, budgets and P&Ls and expenses, large-scale implementation, uh, that long-term strategic planning, all that's critically important, the risk management, the risk mitigants, you have to bring that mindset to the creation of policy. You cannot just bring good ideas coming through. You need to be able to come through and work with those agencies and understand, do we have the capacity to be able to absorb this? We cannot continue to just add. That is what is going on. We've got a 46% in our budget since 2019. I don't think most of you know that. That is like unheard of. And so we have to start looking, and I know that has come up tonight in terms of efficiencies, process improvements, looking at all these programs that we have right now, we cannot continue to just add. I think the question also came up around, you know, what do I want to come through in terms of policies? 
Um, I'm not going to come through and say, you know, I'm going to stand for X, Y, and Z. I'm going to try to push these bills through. I'm going to come to you and say, how am I approaching things? It's really about the how. What we really need to do in that strategist in me is get laser focused. What I heard tonight is flooding. We are trying to sort of solve all environmental concerns at once and putting that burden on a lot of Vermonters. You need to get laser focused and focus on one thing at a time. Choose one thing in terms of environment, let's fix flooding, right? Education, we know there's a committee that is set up this summer, hopefully to come back with at least a draft plan in October and a final plan by December. Let's hope they do that and have a long-term, year-over-year accountable plan with metrics you can hold your state house representatives accountable for because that is the only way it's going to work. Um, speaking of that education budget, Kane, thank you for pointing out the fact that I was a, a yes, as two others in our room representing our Harwood board were also yeses back in May. Our Harwood budget went up 5%. Your taxes went up 15%. Before this budget, we were sending 10% of our property taxes back to Montpelier. I think it's probably more like 15% right now. So we are redistributing a lot. I think a lot of people care a lot about equity. The problem with that is there's not traceability. So we're using that money as a proxy for saying that we are providing equity to these students who desperately need help. And those are the children in poverty. English is a second language and those needing special education. But this gets back to accountability, people. We need to make sure that all of these programs have metrics, have reporting, have accountability. I then asked, what am I gonna do as a junior, a newcomer or freshman in the state house? I'm gonna bring that mindset, not just to the committees I sit on, but all of those committees, and sit there and ask the hard questions, because that is gonna catch on. You need to infiltrate in there and just bring that business mindset in around accountability. What are the metrics? Do we have the capacity? You know, I, I talk to people even just in our town who are trying to implement uh, the conservation committee in terms of bills that were passed years ago. How are we absorbing this? How are we making this happen? The busyness of just passing these bills is not making progress for us. Um, child care, yes, critically important. So both of my kids were both in child care, both in Stowe, one at Apple Tree, <coughs> one at kids' school. Both of those schools are still uh, alive and thriving, um, and they have both grown substantially. What I've also seen is that a number of those schools and child care providers, the day home providers, have gone away. We've actually made it extremely difficult. We have fewer and fewer providers in our state right now. We need to be looking, and this applies to a lot of the trades as well. We've made it really difficult for people to be able to provide these services. Never mind the fact, and this is a fact, our, our uh, 40 to 54 year olds, we've lost 20% of them since 2010. We've lost 11% of our zero to 17 year olds. That's because our workers and our working families have left the state. So when you're trying to find childcare, it's because those workers aren't here. And I think a lot of those people who own businesses are also struggling to find those employees. We have got to find a way to make it affordable for people to live here. Otherwise, there literally is no one to work, and that includes those child care providers. Um, those were the major points. You brought up a lot of good points, so I'm going to hand it off here to John. Thank you. Thank you, Elizabeth. I wanted to touch on a couple of things that were brought up. Um, child care is one. So I'm on the board of directors for Hunter Mountain Children's Center. Um, I, we're responsible for passing a budget. It's incredibly challenging to um, to retain staff, but our executive director done an amazing job at that. Um, but when we had our first child, we put our name in the list, and he didn't get into that center until he was four and a half years old. We were on the wait list for four and a half years. My neighbor ran an in-home daycare, and she moved out of state during that time. Uh, our child care that we were in was a private provider, and she closed two weeks after we told her we were having our second child, and she gave us two weeks notice to find another provider. Um, another provider took us in, and she went over capacity, and then when she was over capacity, she actually, there was a, somebody that came in and sent kids home. Um, I think that, I heard somebody say, who is it good for? Is this gentleman here? Um, well, when we pass bills, we also have to think about who it's not good for. I think there's a lot of unintended consequences with trying to do more and, and to help out. So we have to be very, very focused on not only what are we trying to achieve, but what could possibly be the consequence. Um, I believe that WCX did an article on childcare and the number of providers that have 
closed up shop um, about a year or two ago. And at that time it was, I think we were at 60% of the capacity that we had from the previous five years. So we've been implementing new rules, implementing new policy um, with, everybody here has the best intention. I don't question anybody's intentionality. Um, but reality is we have unintended consequences. And that's just one example. Child care is one example. Um, the new uh, payroll, tax credit, uh, payroll tax that was implemented to fund um, some of these efforts actually hurts our ability to pay um, our staff at HMCC wages. We are very much constrained financially. So we have to look at every single legislative action, not only who is it good for, but who is it not good for. And honestly, uh, where the rubber meets the road for me, if I were to be elected, I don't believe that I would have a lot of influence in Montpelier. I believe that I would get stuck on a committee that my committee chair very likely would not take my vote very seriously or take my ideas for policy very seriously, being in the minority party. Um, but I really want to be there to try and influence people's mindset, influence their ideology, provide just a, a juxtaposition to ideas, and, and hopefully provide some accountability um, and some more um, diversity of ideas. So for me, affordability means maybe doing less intentionally. Um, I think we passed 70 bills in the last three days of the session this year. That's insane. That's a, a lot of new legislation. Um, and, and who's going to implement it? Who's going to execute it? Who's going to fund it? Who's going to be accountable for it? How, are we going to go back and revisit it if it's not functioning the way it's intended? So my perspective would be to intentionally be accountable about what we're trying to do and, and try and do a little bit less or do it a little bit slower. Look back at what we've done from years past and make changes. Um, so that's child care is one part. Um, there, there's other areas, um, and, and honestly, I, I got lost on my track, train of thought here for some of the other questions. I do believe, to ask an early, answer an early question, yes, I do believe climate change is man-made. I do believe that um, we're doing a, a lot of work in that arena, um, but I'm not sure if we're getting, it, getting the benefit that we hope we're gonna get with the amount of money we're spending on it. Um, I believe the, the uh, the new electric bill, I forget the, the bill number, it's escaping me, is anticipated to increase uh, utility rates by about a billion dollars, a half billion to a billion, depending on who you ask, over the next 10 years. That's a lot of money. And that money, that could be invested if we were going to raise those fees or taxes in flood prevention. Um, there's other things that we could do that have more tangible impacts and benefits to Vermonters. So for me, it's really about practicality. I love to help people. I think that Government sometimes wants to do too much. Uh, look at the flood response in our community. Our community members have done exceptional. Um, the state of Vermont, the federal government, FEMA's not here, nobody's here to help except for our neighbors. Uh, local control is key, and I think that we need to try and make an effort in retaining local control as much as possible. Good. Thank you, John. Thanks. Um, thank you, everyone, um, for your very thoughtful comments and um, uh, and your passion. Um, you know, we heard a lot of comments this afternoon, this evening, and they are fueled by the passion that you have for this community, this state, the passion you have for your families. And um, we don't always agree as citizens, um, but the ability to express that passion about what is important to you is really really important. I want to um, address a, a couple of things. Um, first off, I am going to talk about child care because Act 76 was a, a direct result of the work that was done in my committee. And uh, this is actually already having some of the data that you folks are talking about is old. Um, for the first time in many years, the number of new programs opening uh, is outpacing those that are closing. So we're having a net gain in the number of child care providers in the state, which is um, huge. It's absolutely, absolutely critical and huge. Um, the other thing that's happening is the average wage of those working in child care and early learning is going up. It's going up as a result of um, what we uh, are able to invest here. And we hear from child care providers all the time about their ability to expand their programs. Um, the number of new slots has opened up for the first time. The number of infant and toddler slots 
is increasing. Um, all of these are the result of Act 76. And um, just to put in perspective, the 0.11 that may or may not come out of a paycheck is about a dollar a week for somebody um, earning $50,000 a year. And it is, I believe, a worthwhile investment um, for our state and our community, for our businesses. We saw during COVID that childcare uh, was uh, called out as an essential service so that people could continue to work in those fields that they needed to, particularly in healthcare. Um, so um, that, that bill is making change. It's one of the, uh, I have to say in my nine years, it is the single most uh, important investment that I think that we've made that has had the biggest impact in the short amount of the shortest amount of time. Um, it's only been in effect for about a year, uh, and it still is rolling out. So in October, um, more middle income families will benefit from uh, the Act 76. So it's also something that we did not only for people of low incomes or no incomes, but for middle income families. Um, and uh, it would be wonderful if people were able to if they wanted to stay home. Um, however, it is an economy right now where um, if, if you are in a family that has two parents, then um, most, most of those situations, both parents are working. Um, somebody said it, uh, you know, that the legislature found four, I'm gonna move on to education now. Uh, somebody said they found um, that the legislature found 14% to be acceptable. Uh, nothing could be further from the truth. If we thought it was acceptable, we wouldn't be doing things to try to uh, address that issue. Um, I'm not going to stand here and say that what we have in our education system is affordable. I do not believe that it is. I agree with one of the speakers who said that we, uh, we do need to consolidate some of our smaller schools. I think that we're doing things that uh, it don't make sense. So on, on one hand, we're promoting the consolidation of smaller schools. On the other hand, the Agency of Education is giving out small school grants. Um, so that doesn't make any sense to me. Um, we are, um, we're promoting business through the, uh, what's called the TIF program, tax increment financing. And that tax increment financing uh, alleviates paying the education portion uh, for large-scale developers in the name of development. Who do you think is paying the rest of the property taxes that those developers are not paying? All the rest of us right now. Um, there is a disconnect, I think uh, Landall pointed this out. There's a disconnect between who votes on what we spend and then who has to come up with the money to figure out how to pay those bills. Um, the legislature does not vote on what we spend on education. Um, that happens out in the communities. I heard Jonathan just say all about local control. Um, small communities are not going to vote to close their schools. We just saw that in Worcester just the other day. Um, that was in the news. Those are things in our own school district. You know, it was rough. I went to some of the meetings. It was rough um, having this discussion. And it was taken off the table because it was so divisive. We need to put that back on the table and I thank the school board members who are here and hope that that's gonna come back on the table. Um, accountability and making sure that we're doing things that we should be doing. I 100% agree with that. I can tell you that the Agency of Education is probably the most understaffed agency in state government right now um, in terms of what is being asked of them. Um, somebody mentioned here, uh, somebody working in public safety I think mentioned um, the issues with that. We have um, a number, hundreds of positions that are going unfilled in state government right now. Um, we do have to listen to differing points of view. Uh, every single day in our committees, we listen to differing points of view. Um, it's not at all, everybody's uh, on board and it's a kumbaya moment and we all you know, sit around and applaud each other for doing a good job. We have to listen to good point, to differing points of view in order to make uh, good policy. And uh, I'm running out of my time here. Um, but I, I think that some of the things that we have to be prepared to do are things that people are not going to find uh, popular. They're not gonna find it popular to close schools. Uh, people are talking about giving incentives to merge schools. Uh, 
I, I'm not sure that's going to be enough, frankly. Uh, I'm not sure that leaving those decisions up to communities are, are going to do it. Um, those are the things that we have to think about. We have to think about class sizes. We, we have over 20,000 fewer students in the state. Um, we do have to think about those things. Um, you know, there's differing opinions about whether people want that dictated from AOE or the legislature, or whether people want to make those decisions at the local level. Um, is, there, is there a way to think about that? So those are all those things that need to be considered when we're, when we're talking about education. Um, I, I do want to um, just end, I guess, by saying that you know, some of the Front Porch Forum posts have really called into question whether I care about this community. <laughs> so, <laughs> sorry, it's emotional for me. I grew up here, I went to school here. I own a home here and I pay taxes here. I serve the community in multiple ways. I'm a member and past president of the Rotary Club, Rotary Club that provides multiple services in this community every year. I'm a member and past president of Revitalizing Waterbury, which has contributed to the economic vitality of our community. I volunteered at the Senior Center. I served as co-president of the Waterbury Historical Society, working to preserve the history of this great town. I served on the school board for 12 years, the majority of them as chair. And that's when we merged Waterbury and Duxbury School Districts. That was a hard decision. Duxbury did not want to give up its corner school. That was a hard decision. We did that, and we saved millions of dollars for Waterbury and Duxbury because it was less expensive to educate that group of kids closer to home. I chaired and provided case management services and fundraising at Rebuild Waterbury after Tropical Storm Irene. We helped 105 families get back into their homes or into other safe housing. And we raised over a million dollars to do that. And for the last nine years, I've served this community in the legislature, doing things like expediting the local option tax so that our community can benefit from the people who spend their money here, helping people to apply for unemployment, gotcha, during COVID. <laughs> I'm almost done. <laughs> getting permits acted upon for businesses when they're having a hard time getting through the fire safety division, answering questions about state government. Um, all this is about representing all the people in the communities, not just Democrats, not just progressives, not just Republicans, not just anybody, um, everybody. And I never signed up to be a politician, and frankly, I still don't consider myself to be a politician. The three Ps that I care about are policies, programs, and serving the people of the state of Vermont. Thank you, Teresa. Um, just to respond very quickly to a couple of things. Um, thank you, Mr. Martin, for, for coming back and stating that, that this is not personal. Um, earlier tonight, I appreciate that. The words that were used online were taken very personally, and they were done in a way that I thought was, for someone who hears so much from people, I, I don't hear positive from everybody I hear. That's not my job. Um, but to really have my integrity attacked um, just really disappointing. So um, I appreciate the apology um, this evening. I'm going to run through a few questions um, that, that I heard. I'm not sure I'm going to get to the 18 that I have here on the list, but um, so please pay attention. In terms of landlords, um, Joe, I've worked with the landlord-tenant situation as long as I've been in the state house, whether there's a new study. What's clear is the tensions between landlords and tenants right now are at the highest they've been in the last 15 years that I've served. And this comes from uh, a peak in 2019, 2020, during COVID in 2021, where representatives from the Landlord Association and the representatives from Legal Aid sat down with us and told us they had done a study that said when it comes to evictions, 70% of them are about money, period which surprised me because there's this stereotype that the relationship between landlords and tenants is always nasty, and that's not true. It's 30% of them, of those 50% are, are um, 
money and behavior. And then there's, there's left the 15% where there's irreparable damage being done to the relationships between the landlords and tenants, which leads to um, what we've seen in the last three years as rents have gone up is it's been harder for people to move from apartment to apartment. We've seen people who are extremely angry at being evicted um, trashing apartments to, the, to a higher degree, a higher expense. And so these are real issues and these are real things that are happening um, that are contributing to the high cost of landlord, tenant or to rent, um, but also the high cost of the, the increase in uh, real estate. Everybody's real estate has gone up 20 to 40 percent. Um, the tax situation hasn't changed as much to address that, but it has blown out the market, whether it's, um, whether it's short-term rentals or, or even trying to find landlords to come back into the business. The state, we've, we've instituted programs where <laughs> landlords are given subsidies now, can apply for subsidies if they are trying to bring an out-of-code apartment back online. And at this point, there's been over 300 of those apartments that are being funded, that's been funded by federal money, and now it's gonna be funded by state money. So there are programs in place. To the child care question, um, it doesn't happen overnight. Teresa and others have worked on that issue on a policy level for years and years, and it took a large study that was done three years ago that crystallized what, what should happen. And then it took two years for her committee to get it through because people have different opinions about whether or not there should be more daycare or less daycare. And those are valid conversations that we have every day when we're working on these issues. It became clear to attract young families to the state. We're trying to have people come in and, and replace those of us with gray hair. You're talking about, well, where are they gonna live? How are they gonna get there? What jobs are they gonna have? And are there just gonna be daycare? And is there gonna be family leave to help them in a, in a way to take care of their kids and take care of their parents? Those are all expensive propositions. They don't happen overnight, and they don't happen without hours and hours and hours of conversation, even with the Republican members on my committee. Their opinions are as valid as mine are when we're discussing these policies, and that's something that I carry with my work all the way through. You don't see that bipartisan work because it's in committee. You can watch it on YouTube if you like. It's a little bit like watching paint dry, but oil paint dry. Um, just a couple of other questions to, in terms of how do I reach out to all? How do we reach out to all? Front Porch Forum started after Tropical Storm Irene and it has been in lieu of having um, a, a newspaper with, you know, with, with paper or with we done. When we had the Waterbury record, it went to every house. Not everybody read it, but it went to everybody's house. And that's kind of where we could go with communicating. That's really, it's up to the people to get the paper to read it. But it was a great thing to have. It's a great thing to have roundabout. It's a great thing to have front porch forum um, to get the word out to the, to the people who do choose to subscribe. Um, the affordability crisis is the biggest thing, and it depends. You know, some of this that's hard to hear is that the work that we're doing doesn't get out. So again, if it takes years to develop a policy whether it's about river safety, whether it's about climate change, yes, Duncan, yes. It's not even a question to me. It's a stipulation that humans have caused climate change. Fixing it, it's more about how do we mitigate our lives while we're here? How do we make our lives better? Will we ever stop flooding the river? Will it finally come to my house? It hasn't come to my house yet. But will it come to my house? The stress and the PTSD that people are, not just the people who are getting, um, who, who are getting hit again and again and again. We can't underestimate the mental health of our neighbors who are getting hit and it's an ex existential piece of saying, how am I gonna live here again? Should I muck out again? Somebody came up to me, I'm 74 years old, why should I keep mucking out? And so those are questions that I don't have answers for, the legislature doesn't have answers for. Affordability, I don't control, the legislature doesn't control, the state doesn't control mortgage prices. The cost of money has doubled in the last four years. We didn't do that. That happened at the international level and the national level. Plywood is two or three times more expensive now than it was three years ago. How did that happen? There's wildfires in Canada. 
you know, there's supply chain issues. Those are things that we can't control. So even the affordable housing that we're investing in, we're making 20% less than we expected to because the amount of the costs have gone up that much. So I just, I just want to um, finish up with the questions, the ones that I can answer quickly. Um, rank choice, Rick, mm -hmm. for certain positions, that's fine. I don't know how it would work in this case here, but it's, it's worked and not worked in certain places, and it's a hard thing for people to grasp because we're so used to 50% plus one. Um, and I'll, I'll just finish up with a little bit more biography. Um, the thing about this job that, I, again, I feel it is a privilege to have had and to have received the votes of, of the people who have elected me to this position. It, we work from January to May doing this work. And then we're, we work, we, we're your representatives now. If you, have, if you have a need, you call us. And the phone calls that I've received um, over the last 15 years range from things that I should have never heard about. But people felt like they were at the deadest of ends. And to talk people through um, emotional moments, I'm not trained in it. To be able to think where can they find help to ask them to find help, that's constituent service that I, I was never trained in. But that's what we do. That's what we're asked to do. And I've been privileged to be able to do that. Um, to say that we simply walk in and walk out and vote on, along the lines of a supermajority, you know, it misreads where we are as a state. You vote us in. I didn't make up a supermajority. Vermonters vote in their own individual representatives. And it's shown recently across the state that 70% of Vermonters voting have voted for Democratic representatives. And it ends up with where we are, sometimes progressive. And yet we elect a governor from another party with 70% of the vote. <coughs> that's a democracy. And that's where the hard part for us especially at the end of the year, is saying, we want to work with the executive branch. We want to find the way. And out of all of the bills that have passed, you can say, oh, only eight were vetoed out of the 70, plus the ones that were passed before the last week of session. So it's just, I just want to be, I just want to be clear. I love this community. All right. I came and moved here in 1996. I had a little baby and a two-year-old. And the first person who knocked on our door was Val Vincent. And that was my introduction to door knocking. I had no idea who she was. It was 1996. What, you know, it was before Act 60 passed. It was before um, the Baker decision passed. It was, it was a relatively quiet time. But that personal, in that personal meeting got me hooked into how close we are to all of our people here. And the fact that, that 12 years later, I could run for this office. In the meantime, I served on the children's room. And I served on revitalizing Waterbury. I was on the Waterbury, the downtown designation committee that created the downtown uh, designation, and which is now all of what, um, or half of what RW is, along with being a tourist organization. So, these are pieces of, of this town, and this district, that make me um, want to continue. Even in the face of being criticized, I can take it. You know, that's our job. Um, but we are setting there with the goal of helping make Vermont more affordable for the people who need it most. And that's really, that group is getting bigger and bigger. But when we can say to families of small children that your child care costs have been lowered to the degree that they are. You know, if we can raise minimum wage in a responsible way that balances off between what the, the, the employer's needs and the employee's needs are to 
to get to a livable wage, that makes it more affordable to live here. We can't control everything, but we control and we work on and we, and we compromise and we do the things that we can to do the best. That's, that is my motivation, is to do the best I can for the state of Vermont and for the people who live here. Um, thank you for your support in the past, those who have supported me. Thank you for people who don't support me for letting me know, because it's humbling and, and, and it's necessary. And um, thank you all for coming out tonight. Please, if you can, uh, over the next couple of weeks, keep your neighbors and your thoughts. If you can volunteer time downtown, please do. Um, and I appreciate everybody for coming out tonight, for Elizabeth for setting this up, for Jonathan, for Teresa, and working with Teresa over the last nine years, um, where we're kind of dealing with the same population of folks with issues that are the underpinning of our economy. And so it's been a, it's been a privilege to serve with Teresa. Thank you. All right, thank you. All right, that is the show tonight. Uh, thanks to all of you for coming out again, for all of you that had a great time. We will be back here on the 29th of July for, uh, to talk about flood mitigation.